What I'd like to do is just talk for about five minutes about the subject and then let's just get started in the conversation, okay, so that your, your concerns and your suggestions can be, can be brought out. Um, you know, to the faculty here in the Luskin School of uh, Public Affairs, uh, you know, this is all about what life is right here in this classroom. Uh, learning about certain things that are difficult, uh, having a, a broader and higher consciousness about uh, the problems that people face in their individual lives. And uh, so it all boils down to uh, the pursuit of knowledge and really the purpose of life. And then, you know, what I'll talk about is the pursuit of relationships and then uh, we'll focus in on the gang problem, okay? So uh, my, my first of all uh, belief in a system is one that uh, when you talk about people, you're always going to have to talk about problems. I don't care what they are. I mean, you know, we're going to talk about a gang problem, but the point is, is that there isn't such a thing as people without problems. And, and, and it all starts, uh, quite frankly, at a young age, and then it morphs itself up into adulthood. And so, uh, what, what I what I try to do is focus you in a place where the road to problems is present. Uh, and the question is always going to be, what are you going to do when you're confronting a problem? And the gang situation that we're going to lead up to as a specific example uh, is just one example of many, many kinds of examples of how people uh, get into a way of living that is sometimes counterproductive, often self-destructive, and as a result uh, becomes uh, almost uh, perilous way of life. Uh, so therefore, uh, what, what I want to say to you is that the first challenge of all children uh, at a certain age, and I don't know when it all starts, but I remember when I was five years old and four years old, my mom and my sister were teaching me uh, alphabet and teaching me how to spell my name and counting and sewing. I even learned to sew, you know, when I was around six years old because my mom was a very good seamstress. That's what she did for a living. And so, so the question of, 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 of teaching and having a relationship uh, with an adult, now, the first step of that relationship is supposed to be your mother and father. But look what's happening to a lot of children, you know, when you think about it. You know, uh, there's been a collapse uh, in the... Uh, and the commitment of a father in the history of the last 40 years or more. That, 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 that men are uh, almost uh, oblivious uh, in certain forms of maleness to what it means to be a father. That it's kind of a situation where um, they just cut out. Now, and, and that was true of my case in my mom. My mom was a divorce of about 11 months old. So, uh, and my dad's a nice person. He wasn't uh, a drug dealer or a drug user, or he was in the Navy when he left the house, and so the World War II thing. And so ultimately, he got out, and then he, he got, just got carried away like all sailors when they're on leave. Um, and probably had too much fun on the downtime, and he figured out, well, I'm going to keep on having fun instead of being uh, a present father. But the, the key is that. Uh, all, all aspects of human development, in my opinion, are to what extent is a child-adult relationship positive and to what extent is a child-adult relationship negative. And, and, and let me tell you, uh, the sad side of the story is that there are adults that have less common sense at times than children. You know, children are typically afraid, and adults tend to be thoughtless about what it's like to be afraid. And so you have all these converging contradictions in many lives, and it doesn't mean just gang members' lives, it means everybody's life. So where, where I go to is that I was given special uh, tools, I think, as a child, because I always believe in positive common sense. Now, you don't have to know your alphabet to have positive common sense. 
I, I was learning mine fast, but the key is you don't have to know much of anything to have positive common sense. You just have to hold to that principle if you have it in your in your ability as a child. You, you know, there, there are things that you should do, and there's things you shouldn't do. There are things that your negative uh, exposures are that you can sink into your heart and make it a part of you, or you can just keep it out at the at the wall that you create around yourself. And, and, uh, and if I were raising or teaching a parenting class, this is what this leads to. Because you're going to find out that most gang members, if not all, have terrible parenting examples. And as a result of the terrible parenting examples, uh, their, their core is totally uh, disjointed. They don't, they don't have a common sense positive core. It's an us versus them world that they're into. Even us for me versus my mom, me versus my non existent dad, me versus my fear, me versus my particular uh, challenges in life. Uh, me looking at others suspiciously, me not liking what I look like, uh, me not liking the fact that I want to be seven feet tall and the best basketball player in the world, I'm only five feet tall. I mean, you know, human beings are, are, are stuck in a negative relationship even with themselves. Even if there's a lot of positives around, that's how fragile being a human being is. Does it make any sense so far? Okay, so the question then is, um, what is the common characteristics that a gang member uh, has as a human being? And, and, and we're talking, in my case, about the males. I, I, I did the next lecture talk about the females. But the, the key to, to my point is that men have always been fragile uh, in a variety of ways and overcompensate. Uh, for that. Uh, and as a result of overcompensating, uh, they do some not so positive, nonsensical things, uh, and as a result, uh, find themselves in a lot of upheaval in their lives. And so uh, I feel that when you look at the path to so the programming uh, that's negative, and the common sense, the, 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 the lack of common sense that's practiced by people who are gang members, uh, that it, it, it's hard uh, to uh, unprogram all those records in the brain uh, that are so uh, disjointed and so unfulfilling for the person that has it. And so there it is, right there. That's what it is. And so it manifests, as you know, in violence, it manifests in a bunch of uh, uh, somewhat clickish behaviors uh, where, where you're going along with uh, your set, as they say, or your, your group. And, uh, and you're basically uh, tested uh, for loyalty on something that doesn't make any sense. And, and yet they think it makes sense because it's one of those love things, you know, if you ever really get down to it, you know, the, the whole thing is, is that your homie loves you more than anybody else, and you love your homie more than anybody else, and, and then you go to the extreme, right, which doesn't make sense. That you're really, you're willing to give up your life for your homie. Give up your life? <laughs> what is this all about? It says, when does love require you to give up your life? You know, but, but you know, this is how they think, you know, so... So what they're willing to do is, and this is how they do it, by the way, the shot callers may not be able to give up their life because they're, they want to be a shot caller, right? You never, they're never going to be a gang shot caller to say, I'm going first. You know, I'll go out there and risk my life for you. The shot caller will always say, hey, homie, man, you know, you got to show your homies that you're going to give your life for us, man. You know, you know we love you. You know, we, we picked you up when you were just roaming around the street, and uh, we got you in, and now you got us, and blah, 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 blah. So then what happens is if they send out this very, very immature youngster and give him a big gun and say, hey, go off that other gangbanger. That, 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 that's something that needs to be done, man. The dude's been acting strange and we've been wanting to let him have a message. And so we got to let the other set know who's the boss. And so they send this kid out there and he blows up another kid and he goes and gets arrested uh, by the sheriff's department, the LAPD or something like that. 
And um, they end up, you know, I used to have about 18 murders in the county jail where adults were supposed to be until I finally uh, forced the court to get them out of my jails and put them in juvenile facilities. But, but I'd go in there on Christmas Day with Cardinal Mahoney uh, after he did mass for the inmates. And these kids, you know, they were like maybe this tall, about 120 pounds, uh, in a male adult jail, single cell. Uh, so we're passing out a little religious stuff, and, and I'm right behind Cardinal. And the, the youngsters kind of like dazed that anybody's there, uh, particularly me. And um, he looks at me, but this happens so many times, I'm just trying to tell how sad it is. You know, they look at me, you know, they're behind the bars, um, 16 years old. Um, the Cardinal does a nice thing, and then I'm there. And then they, they look at me and then I say, you know, bless you. God bless you. I said, uh, sir, yes. did you do something for me? I said, sure. So I put my hand through the water hole, through the little port, and we clasped hands and they say, would you pray for me? I said, well, Sure, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. So you know, what, what, what's going on here is that there needs to be responsible adults immediately in the lives of young people who are bouncing off of the negative, non-common sense forms of thinking. There has to be a huge amount of reality that even when you see a guy walking down the street, it's right on the edge of being a gang member. They really need adult interaction. They're going to have it with their mother, most likely. But they really need it with more women and more men. And we don't, they don't need to go to another classroom. They don't need another funded program. They don't need much of anything. They just need interaction with positive adults who can hang with all the nonsense that's in their head and all the emotional records of the negativity that has occurred through their life and let's just get on with it. You don't have to have a federal program or too many other things, although we probably need all that too. I'm not suggesting that programs don't work. But the commonness of the life of an individual is such that if we just had another consciousness level uh, for the successful adults who are positive, have a lot of common sense, who can just kind of like say, all right, let's talk about things. You talk about it. Like the youngster in the jail, when I stuck my hand in there, he had a request. He didn't say, give me money. He didn't say, do this specific thing, go out there and call my mom. He said, pray for me. Okay, now, that doesn't fly in the common world of sociology or anything else. I'm going to tell you, you read a book, and the sociology book says, the thing the social workers should do is pray for the person who's asking for the prayer. Have you ever seen or read that? Okay, but, but you know what, what, it, what it really means is that he wanted me to care about his purpose in life. That, that, that I'm in trouble, and I, I, I need someone to just say to me, uh, you matter. And if you're the sheriff of Los Angeles County, which is a big, big tool, right? You know, a big, tough tool. And, and, and you're saying, you, you know, I'm going to pray for you. Well, prayer, who knows where it goes? You know, that, that's not the point where it's going. You know, the, the point is, is it, is it have a positive element to it in the mind of the requester? You see, and, and, and so what, what we haven't done is we haven't asked these kids, maybe we need a big survey tool, what can we do for you to keep you positive and use a lot of common sense? What, what can we do for you? That's all I do. You know, so I, I mean, I, I've been accused of being a social worker, which I'm proud of. You know, I'm, I'm the social worker sheriff. Right? But, but wouldn't it be wonderful if we kind of got off this idea of what is the only kind of social worker? There's a lot of kind of social workers. 
But the, the key to this is to, to have a culture of law enforcement be one that offers answers to people who obviously are looking for them. Even the ones that are negative are looking for answers. So the first point of contact is to be uh, in your face or defiant or some kind of thing. That's why Father Boy, you're Father Boy, right? Hey, you guys are saints. I mean this. I'm not just trying to make a comment. You know how sainthood occurs in Catholic Church? You do what Father Boy is doing. You fight your own demons. A couple of cancer bouts. You know, and you have a uh, positiveness. He has a complete positiveness. There, there isn't anything about this man that I know that is negative. He's, he's, uh, he's obviously a man of God. But, 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 you know, but I'm a weak Catholic, so I don't want you to get to me. You know, I will acknowledge that. I said, man, I, I can't get all that, man. That's, that's a whole lot of stuff. You know. What is it? The three things. <laughs> There's three bosses in my life. I can only handle half of one. You know? but, uh, but I'm weak. But I, I, I'm still in there. You know, I haven't left it out. You know, I, I'm just, I'm just. I said, you know, I'm just going to be like it to love your fellow man. That's my only commandment. I, uh, I can't get into the rest. Except don't kill. You know, I don't believe that violence. The whole thing. But. The, 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 talk, the point then is, is that we're in a place with uh, gang members that there is no solid, reliable, consistent, adult interaction. That's what changes behavior more than anything else. And they need it even if they're 30 years old. This is really interesting. You know, some people stop their mature growth and their emotional growth around 10 when mom told them they're never going to mount it and you remind them of your uncle in jail. And, and there's so much negative discipline going on with uh, gang members' lives. You know, parents overwhelmed with stress. I hate you! You know, you're just like your father. The father's never aroused. The kid doesn't know what the father's about. And, and so they use all these negative things to control their kids. You know, shocking, shock wave. And I'll tell you, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. But there's one thing I know about negativity to a child. It shocks their nervous system, even if they keep their mouth shut. And you know what? They don't go back to normal the next day or the next hour. They hold on to that for about three days. <coughs> then they're finally okay. Then they're finally okay. Mom's all right. She's still feeding me. And we got a little more positive going on. She got it off her chest. But the, when she blasted me, it was a disconnect, emotional disconnect. And then it comes back. But you can only do that blasting so much. But there are some parents that will blast two days in a row. And then they'll blast three or four or five days in a row. And you know what? By the time you get that seventh day of blasting your kid, they're totally unconnected emotionally. They've buried whatever their trust in you is and say, you know what, you don't count anymore. You might be my mom, I'm going to kind of go along with the game because I have no choice. But we're not connected anymore. That's when they go out to the street. All right, that's enough for that. Now, make any sense for all that? Okay, who has any suggestions so that I can incorporate? <laughs> yes? I appreciate a lot of what you said about the human condition. But not everybody who experiences things the way you describe becomes a gang member. I'm wondering if you can talk at all about the societal or, or structural or poverty or, or anything else that might contribute to this. Okay, you asked two questions there. You asked how do you manage without having to go all negative, and then, then you're saying at the same time how do you bring the public in to help you or is the social fabric or whatever. Which of the two questions I'm going to ask? Uh, the first, the first question you just said it was more of an agreement with you. So I'm looking more at the, the social context. Well, you see, I, I, the social context is an asset more than it is a liability. You just have to know to stay away from negative. You, you know, it's it's not it's not hard. I mean, I grew up right in East Los Angeles, and the leader of the White Fence Gang was the guy that had my same last name, and uh, and all that. But but, but I knew what gangs were, and I didn't want part of it. I made toys. 
I don't care what you do to me. I'm not going there for you guys. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I've got my own purpose in life, and it isn't yours. You have your purpose. I'm not bothering you. You don't bother me. And, and so what, what I'm talking about is the ability to have common sense toward yourself and the social problems that will inevitably come into your life. You do not have to buy into anything that's negative. I never bought into anything that was negative when I was raised by my grandparents. My grandmother's disciplinary role with me was to say, when she got a little upset. Now, she had plenty on her plate. So you, the first thing you got to do is learn how to love your parent and be a, a good child as opposed to a problem child. You know, I don't know how problem child behave because I never give my parents any problem at all. Okay, that, that was my choice. I, I can't be successfully in my mind as a negative person. I want this. I want that. I don't have this. I don't have that. I mean, you know, complaining doesn't help you as a positive human being. You just have to accept what's around you and then work in the framework that you will never let anything negative affect who you are. Now, going outward, when people see a child that looks needy, they need that that child is needy. So I'm not saying everyone's like me. I'm just saying that the structure has to be in place as you're studying to, if you're a sociology major. We need people like you. We, we need people like you, but we need you to be the leader of other adults and not rely on yourself to solve this person's problem 100% on your shoulders. Okay, you know, the best thing about a social worker is that I get a whole lot of people involved in all this. And, and I'm saying, I, I don't put it all on me to correct this individual. That's a psychiatrist being a psychologist role. But even, th there's not enough psychologists or, or psychiatrists to do this. It really is going to take the average good man and the average good woman to volunteer themselves into this process and hang with it as long as they can. And it'll work. I hope that makes sense to you. Yes? I think this might follow up on what you were just saying right now. Um, but just listening to some of your comments, it seems like there's like a morality component to this you're seeing and a lot of personal choice and responsibility. Um, when you're talking about people coming from communities where they don't have good role models, I'm thinking in terms of a solution. I mean, where do you see that coming from? These good role models that they need and good support? Because that's something that you don't think can come from the community. And if it can't come from the community, because you're saying the community mm -hmm. has these deficits, mm -hmm. um, then where does it come from? I mean, are we well, it comes, it comes largely from the school. Uh, you know, once you get into the kindergarten and all the way up to the grades, you know, I, I mean, I hung out in school like a champion. I mean, I, 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 I use my teachers as some basis of positive stability. Okay. And, and, and well, I mean, I, 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 you don't need a lot. You know, see, back to the old thing. People think, well, what, you got to have an abundance of everything. You know, you got to have the great neighbor next door that watches what you do. Then you have the teachers over here. And you got, well, wait a minute. You know, you know, life isn't just made like that. You know, you, you have to have something that symbolizes that you're moving in the right direction in this world. And school is that vehicle. I, I, in all due respect, my, my highest regard is for my teachers. My teachers always uh, dealt with my issues in a positive way, except when I had to write a misspelled word 45 times, three times, and I said, oh, this is too much. But I, I still did it. I was just talking to myself, by the way. But, but, but the, 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 the nature of where do you find that positive, it's publicly acquired in school. And I just love school. And so the point then is, uh, you have to have a, a love affair uh, with your ability to think and be rational and be positive. That, that's the whole point of life. Negative is all around, but you know what? You only, negative is only important when you accept it. When you <coughs> accept that you don't like your life, you're already part of the destruction of your own life. And, and you, you got to stop it. And you know, the, the, the theological point you made, I, mean, I know you want to keep it with me. You're gonna, I'm going to give you that back. But the theological side of this is very much a part of where I am. 
Okay, no, no, I, I won't deny that. And, and what, what, I, what I loved as a child was I loved the trees. And I loved flowers that were blooming. You know, when the winter was coming to spring, if you can't learn as a child to love flowers, what the hell are you going to love? You know, what, what, what are you going to love as a, as, a, as a young person if you're not picking those things that please you, that have nothing to do with yourself and nothing to do with somebody else? It has to do with the reality of life. And if you don't understand that you're a miracle as a human being, and I understood that real early in life, early. And even when I was a child in the seventh and sixth grade, I have these dreams about finding little gold coins. Have you ever had these dreams as a child you found something? Well, when you're poor like I am, you're always looking for something that's different than what you got. But I find these little gold coins, and I was always thrilled to have them. You know what I do with those gold coins? This is a quiz. That's right. I gave them away. You see, that's what made me happy. You know, when you, when you, when you, when you help your parents, or you, when you're not wrong, when your parents are wrong, but you're not wrong, when, when you're doing what you can as a child, you're not wrong if it's positive. Now, I didn't tell you this part. I, I lived with my grandparents, but I lived with my uncle in the same little room, and he was mentally ill. He was born a pound and a half. He, 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 he was premature. He was born in about seven months. This good guy couldn't talk, couldn't say anything straight. He didn't do anything. My grandmother dutifully fed him, bathed him, and so forth. And I, I was there. Now, let me tell you, he's got real problems. Us, we have to be real careful that we don't create more of our own problems because of some of the nonsensical negative stuff that's around us. We have to be careful to understand that as human beings, the greatest creation of all creations is what? Come on, folks, you're college students. What do you think is the most difficult thing? If you believe there's a God or no God, I don't care either way. Yes, sir? Well, I mean, well let's get the answer. Yeah, well, I, I, I I'll think, get back to you. I, I think it's very subjective. No, well, it's, it's whatever it is, but well, I just want your guess. Well, I, I try to answer I think it's very subjective. And this but I don't know if it works for everybody. I'm not trying to. Let's get to what is the most difficult creation that you can identify, science or otherwise? What is it? The most difficult thing to create. Perhaps life. No, 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 no. It's, a, it's an object. What answer that you want? It's an object. And that's not my answer. It is the answer. Okay, look, look, look. You're, you're here. You're going to agree. You're, you're all going to agree. Anybody? Come on, folks. What do you think it took to create your brain? What of all the living things is more functionally sophisticated than your brain? You think the flower has a brain? Do you think, well, animals have brains, right? Do you think the fish brain is more sophisticated than your brain? Do you agree with it? Your brain is more sophisticated than any other thing that you know that lives? Well, now, don't tell me no, because if I do, I'm going to have to have a side conversation with you. Well, I mean, as, as, you know, as we humans think, uh, of course, we are the top of the food chain, right? Mm -hmm. So We are the top of the life chain. Life. I have a question for you. I, I'm a bit confused because, and I, and I appreciate you being here, by the way. Thanks so much for much time of your time. But you, you know, it's a very complex issue, narrowing this on gang members. And I think that you know, you were talking about some of the external pressures uh, that create this particular uh, phenomenon. And yet, you're, you're, then you're talking about, well, just be positive and don't be negative. You know, however, if, if a child is in a particular uh, situation where they don't have that kind of positive input, there aren't the, and, and oftentimes financial constraints are the bottom line. Mm -hmm. There isn't the social uh, facilities out there to su be supportive. If there isn't the families who want to raise kids in a particular right. uh, fashion, Planned Parenthood is being gutted. So, you know, contraception, these types of things are, are taken out of the equation. Right. So you have people who are having kids brought into the world that they really don't want, and they probably never will. Uh, there isn't, uh, as I said, the funding to support these kids. And I think that we say that religion has been around as long as we can think, and that's not always the answer. I'm talking about theology, which is... Not, not religion. religion, but there's, there's some intertwining there. So what, what, 
mechanism can, and, and also, lastly, the department, so law enforcement, is a particular culture that isn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily embrace a lot of the, the I mean, we as social workers, and those of us who are social workers or learning to go in that profession here, are very open to the things that you're talking about, trying to interface with these folks who are having great difficulties. Mm -hmm. But then if law enforcement has a completely different kind of acculturation, uh, and the courts have a different kind of uh, culture, how do we bring all this together to be a comprehensive and cohesive mechanism that supports people who are disadvantaged and who aren't white and straight in this society? Well, you do it by being convincing the good human being, which I know you are. Uh, you see, the, the, the whole point of this is that I'm trying to get you to get out of the textbooks and out of the complexity of the research and get to the core of what is a common thread of change. And you cannot make a child who is uh, in, in trouble with their emotions and their, their self-assessment, you cannot make them a positive, balanced human being if we're preaching negativity as some core value that they should uh, be a part of. You know, I'm trying to get them out of the forest of uh, what is non-productive and negative and get them into the meadows of the flowers that are positive and selectively enforcing your good side as a human being. And, 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 and it's not complicated. You see, it, it, it is not post-analysis based. It is about the fact that your brain, through your eyes and your ears and your uh, sound sensibilities, along with your emotional component, that if you water that garden right, and not even concerned, let me worry about what's negative. That's what I do, that's what I'm paid to do. Uh, I'm the one who's supposed to deal with the worst of the worst of humanity, and I do. But I don't deal with them in a way that is negative. I do it in a way that is positive, because I know they can't change with cop negativity, stranger negativity, family negativity, friend negativity, Negativity is such a destructive reality for some people. They trust no one, they have no comfort, they have no sense of their reports. And my job is to make everyone know that they're important. Even if you're a kid that's 16 years old and committed a murder in jail. It, you know, it, it, it is so relative to trust amongst humanity. And those that are in authority should be the merchants of trust and goodwill. And so that's my answer to you. And I know it's all by this guy and it's preaching too much about theological elements, but the truth is, is that you are a miracle. I mean, there's no rational reason we should all be here. If you really look at it, there is no rational reason why we're all here. There, the universe, and I just saw this the other day with scientists putting it out. The Earth has been, the universe has been existed how many years? Thirteen point seven billion years, and it's expanding out. Okay, it's moving out right now as we talk. Now, thirteen point seven billion years. Ago, I thought it was much longer than that, but that's that's a long time. And and, and here we are. And planets and sun and galaxies and all that stuff. Why is all this going on? I mean, I, I don't think it's just a big bang nonsense thing. I think there's something else and I can't figure it out. I don't even know who God is. God never talked to me. You know, I, I, don't, I don't have any messages from the heavens. But I do know that goodness is what mankind is supposed to be. All right, so we're going to go over here and I'm going to come back to you. You're going to be the last one. Go, go ahead. Um, so, just out of curiosity, what are some things that law enforcement is doing to help Oh, okay. Yeah, well, good idea. We, we got all kinds of youth programs. We have a nonprofit with 16 youth centers throughout the county of LA. LAPD's got something going on as well. And, and what we're doing is we're really see, really interacting with these at risk youth and helping them structure themselves a little more. You know, it takes a lot of discipline to live a life. And, you know, when I'm the master of self discipline, <laughs> but but the, the, the point is, and that's probably the only real degree I have. You know, I have a doctorate in public administration in the other schools, you know, but 
But my real degree is in self-discipline. But also love of the challenge of self-discipline as well as love of mankind. So, so, so that's my job, is love of mankind. But the, the, the key to this whole thing is, is that you got to have a sense of appreciation for life. All life, not just your own, all life. And if you don't have this sense of importance that you live, you see, it's just, it's just an important thing to even be here. I start there. I'm here. And I have to, I get to see, I get to eat, I get to taste, I get to feel, I get to be a little angry at times, I get to be happy most of the time. And so discipline is something that is an actionable as well as an intellectual experience. Now I've run uh, eight miles six days a week for the last 33 years. That's 60. 6,000 miles, so you know how anal I'm about that. And um, the whole point is, is that it's, three, it's two and a half times around the earth in total distance, but my, my goal is to live to be 100 years old. And you're not gonna do it if you're hanging out at McDonald's too much and, and doing the wrong things inside. So, so the, the question is, how much do you love living? And if you can say clearly that you love it a lot, you'll make a great social worker because your common sense is going to tell you what to do. And your technical learning is to difficulties that are categorically evaluated by science. You will be able to match them into your common sense. But the truth is, is you must be the beacon of what a human being should be to be a great social worker. Yes? Oh well, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, 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 I know you're in the program, but you know, I am too. But but I, but what's in the programs is what I'm saying. The VIA program is for kids between 10 and 18. All right, the VIA program is for kids between 10 and 18. And what's amazing about it, when you learn a lot from these kids, they are masters of teaching because when they start talking about their fears and their difficulties, and then we start interacting with all that stuff, you know what? It, it's great. It, 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 it's because truth is what it should be. And, and, it's, and therefore, what happens with the Vita thing is that I've had 10-year-old kids go through this program and they can hold up to it and I have 17-year-old, six-foot-three kids that are crying and you know they're going through all the crisis, which is great too because what they're doing is they're revealing their vulnerability as a human being. Remember, that's where we started with this whole conversation. Vulnerability matters to us. And what we do, because we're cops, right? We, we have big hearts, and I think we're convincingly good human beings, but we know how to deal with vulnerability. And, and the way you deal with vulnerability is you get all the kids to work together. You're know, working together, and, 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 they're, and, they're, and they're a team. And then this one little boy, I'll, I'll never, there's two little boys. I'll give you an example of either, okay? Two little boys. One was an autistic boy who would never talk when you give him a basketball, he was a white kid, okay, with a basketball. And he'd run around all over the place and he was a whole different human being. He found his voice in playing basketball for himself. He was just a little guy. He didn't even have a team. It was just him and the ball and the hoop. And, and, and when we awarded him uh, for his effort, uh, you know, he, would like, he was like this. He was so impressed, somehow, by all the negative, that he couldn't even come out of himself. But we helped him come out of himself. Now the other one was a little boy who was about 17, and he was uh, he was about five feet tall. And you know what he was putting up with, because, you know, let's face it, schools are mean at times. And, and you know what he, he was faced with. You know, he wasn't in trouble with anything about the law, but he was having a big problem with who he was. So but when we got him in this whole Vita program. Uh, we do competitions between all 16 sites, and, and we made him in charge of his platoon. And he stood out there so tall and so proud that he was running the whole show with the contests that we were putting on as to how you move and do the drills and so forth and so on. And, and, and the whole point of it all is that uh, adult positiveness with how to handle your vulnerability 
and how to make yourself the greatest person you can be is what it's all about. Okay, let's get the gentleman all the way on the side. I appreciate you being here. Um, I want to ask you, um, I study leadership and a lot of leaders, uh, great leaders always look at themselves and say, you know, how, how, how is my administration or how have I, uh, what have I done to contribute to the problem that's going on? And you spoke a lot about, um, you know, family structure. You spoke a lot about the importance of individual agency. Um, in, in making your own decisions, um, but what you didn't, what you didn't speak of, of is uh, the fact of uh, racial profiling and uh, how yeah. how cops tend to yeah. um, stereotype and and you know racially profile African American, African -American males and Latino males right. um, significantly higher than others. And okay. so I wanted to know how, because you talk about family structure and you know a lot of our fathers are being detained or even well. in jail longer longer than. Um, longer than other other uh, individuals, um, other races. So I wanted to ask. Okay, you, it was up a lot about five different points, but that's okay. I, um, thing, so I my question remember. is, what has your administration done to integrate um, um, to integrate uh, dialogues about race and racism, di dialogue about stereotypes, dialogue about um, racial profiling along the educational uh, process for your for a lot of your police officers? Well, the first thing you do about having any kind of stereotype is you teach people not to stereotype. It, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting thing. Now, I would also say to you, if I was one of your professors, that my first goal, if I was teaching you, you know, here at the university, I would teach you not to stereotype the cops either. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a two-edged sword. Okay, when you deal with the theories of stereotyping, and, and, and what I uh, believe is important is that uh, there's no room for it. You know, there, 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 there isn't a valid justification for just stopping somebody because of their race, stopping somebody because even if they're, they're tatted up. You, you never know who's tatted up is not a gang member. And, and so, you know what I just shared with you. I'm in the community probably more than any public official. Now, I'm in the community. I'm not giving ceremonial speeches and press conferences. Uh, but the, the thing that I do when I'm, say, at Tam's Restaurant in Linwood, uh, the, you know, I grew up in communities that were uh, very, uh, what I call average East LA, unincorporated. And I, I see a guy who's a homie. I know he's a homie. I see guys that are out of my jail. And they're with their children and their wives. And, and you know what? They always say hi. They always are surprised I'm there where they eat. And you know what they want out of me when they see me? And now this is back to your question. Because I know it was a question designed to get me to tell you. Well, I'm on top of it 100%. I'm not on top of it 100%, but I know that I'm sending the right messages and training people to do it the right way. You know what they want when I see them with their children? They want to take a picture with me. I know, does that sound like racial profile thing? No, what they're saying is, the goddamn sheriff is here, he's eating what I'm eating, and I, my child's here, and so here I am. And I said, absolutely, I'll take a picture with you. So I've got the one father on one side tatted up, the little baby in the mail, and we're taking a picture together. Now, if it sounds like I'm a hostile human being, that's not the impression that the people in my jail have, and that's not the impression that the people that have been in jail, and that's not the impression that gang members who are on the street. Because, because Father Boyle, who you listen to, is a man who understands how to mentor not only the homies, but he knows how to mentor the sheriff. And I'm trying to follow Father Boyle's model because I trust that his theological route is it a convincingly good route? So, so we, we work on it. We even had Stanford, not to go too far from UCLA, <laughs> evaluate our racial profiling statistics, and they gave us a high mark. So validation is what leads to conclusions about racial profiling, and so far we're hanging on. But I don't disagree with your original point. I have to keep on watching this, because it can happen at any time, any place. Okay, uh, the lady behind this lady has had her hand up for 40 minutes. <laughs> uh, I was wondering what you would like to see change, juvenile justice. Well, what I'd like to see. Specifically yeah. in juvenile hall in yeah. regards to gang relations. Well, it's what, gang relations and all relations, because it's, it, you can be it's just as destroyed if you're not in a gang, you're in one. You know, kids in juvenile hall are having difficulty. 
I'll tell you what it is. It's the, it's the bureaucracy that doesn't understand what you should be doing. Now, I went to the UL Hall about three months ago on Sunday. And uh, I had uh, about 40 youngsters uh, who were there. I went into the secure area where the kids are uh, threatening suicide. So the way they have it set up is they have they have a security officer for every one of these kids to make sure that if they're going to make a move for suicide, uh, you got to intervene and stop it, right? Well, guess what? The way it was working, uh, just like this gentleman here, this gentleman here, the, 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 the security guard is sitting right there. And the kid was kind of like on a table in the hall in the, in the, in the foyer. And they're watching the kid, and they're kind of like this. And, and, and bureaucracies operate this way. I'm a security guy. I don't have any role to play in talking to this kid. Whereas if I were running the show over there, I'd say, listen, if you want to work with kids, you better learn how to talk with kids. And, you, you know, let them talk. Let, let them tell you what's on their mind. You know, what we tend to do with these kids is we drug them up. You know, we, we put all kinds of non-depressant you know, non drugs in their system. So they're kind of like this. Would you love your life if you were all drugged up in some kind of juvenile hall? Hell no. But you know what caused you to love your life? So they bring the sheriff in there, and, and then they bring all these kids out to this uh, chapel. Now, I'm kind of lecturing, right? <laughs> you know, but there, you don't lecture with kids. You ask them questions. You know what I mean? How many of you have ever been depressed? Well, that's a pretty big question. Let me ask you this. You're going to have to raise your hand. How many of you have ever been depressed? I'll raise my hand. Okay? Do you care to share that with anybody? Okay. Well, guess what? They thought the cop was going to go in there and say, you shouldn't do this. Don't disobey your parents. Drive safely. Uh, don't steal. And don't take drugs. Come on, that's, that's, they know that already. But what, what they don't know is, is it worth my time to listen to you? Now, the only way for the kids is it going to be worth the time, not as an adult as you, is when you're listening to them. That is what is considered a worthy portion of their time. So by the time we got through, it was like the same time frame we have here. All of them were talking about their fears. All of them were talking about depression. All of them were talking about the things that were troubling them. And that's what they don't do in the probation department. They, they, they don't even have professional social worker probation officers who really understand that this isn't about one hour sessions or 30 minute sessions. It's about that and it's about everything that's culturally designed to communicate with these youth in a positive way. About what? They're not so positive life experiences. But if you're one that's joining in with negative indifference, and the indifference is about the most negative thing you can have in this world, in my opinion. When you see a suffering soul and you don't care enough to sit back and, and be involved in it, and stop your day, and stop your process for the sake of other people. It is missionary work. Social work is missionary work. I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> you know, if you, if you don't have that in your soul, then you're going to serve society, and you're going to do missionary. Now, it's not theological missionary work. I, I'm not telling you to bring God in anything. Now, I, I, I'm just telling you that the, the, the whole point of social work is, is, is to care to the extent that it inconveniences the hell out of you. Okay. All right. Over here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you again for being here. And um, I think one of the points you've, you've really hammered home again and again that I most appreciate is the idea that it's not about the curriculum, it's not about the program, it's not about the structure of what we might be providing. It's really about those interactions and it's really about how we communicate and, and role model for young people. And I really agree. And I have um, about 15 years' experience working with mentoring programs. And I've seen it specifically for youth who are involved in juvenile justice and foster youth and some of the youth in really tough situations. And we've seen some really positive results with mentoring, just having that 
that older person who's just willing to talk and hang out. What we've also noticed, though, is that, you, is that even a mentoring program actually takes funding and actually takes support and structure and all those things. So what I'm wondering is, what would you recommend about, since we are social work and related programs, and since we are working through program contexts, like you say, mm -hmm. how can we make our programs more interaction focused? What would you recommend in those settings to make it more like what you're talking about? Well, I, I think that you need to infuse with your paid position more resources, which means if I were a social worker, and I am one, I have 4,000 volunteers that help the sheriff's department, right? So I'm out there hustling help, right? But what I believe, as you heard by my example, my grandparents were retired, and older people can do a lot of this good listening stuff. Uh, there are those that want to. And I would, I would uh, push out to you as a social worker, you got to go find senior citizens that need a little something uh, to do that's positive, even if it's for two or three hours a day. You don't have to work them too hard, you know, that sort of thing can get exhausting for some of the seniors here. But uh, the nature of the social worker is to not rely exclusively on yourself. If you believe that you're the sole factor in the positive upgrowth, upticks in people's lives, you make a mistake. You have to realize that it's networking these kids through a process of adult interactions that is your number one job. Not what you say, but what that person's fuller experience of adult relationships can be. And, 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 and trust me, if, if you, and I, 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 the other school I talked to, this social worker school, but the, this school I'm talking to now, if any of you would want some help from the sheriff's department in any respect regarding some of the charges that you're facing with these young people or not so young, we're willing to partner up with you. We're willing to say, okay, well, send them over here to uh, the sheriff's department and we'll sit out for a little while, you know, just to get them out of whatever that routine that they're in. But we'll be positive. You, you, know, you, know, you, you can have one positive thing, 10 positive things, 30 positive things. Before you know, you think the world is such a beautiful place like I do. And yet, I face negative more than you do. You know, I'm, I'm facing people whose lives are completely broken, who have no more experiences that are worth living for than anyone else because they're in jail. <laughs> you know, you're, you're dealing with people that are in jail too. But, but the, the whole point of it all is that I'm trying to get you to believe that the paradigm of loving your life is paramount to the success of helping someone else love their life. Because if you don't love your life, they can see through some of your doubt. But human beings do not need doubt. Human beings have plenty of their own doubt that they manufacture. They don't need yours. They don't need your negativity. They don't need your bad experiences. They don't need to even hear that you got stopped by some nasty cop and it was not fair. All they need to know is that life is worth fighting for. That is what you teach them. You must fight for your life. You can't give up. You're never coming back. I got news for you. There's no such thing as reincarnation. And you got a question. It's okay, but the point you made, let's start with that, then I'll come back to you. Love doesn't come from a point of understanding. It comes from a point of appreciation. You, you see, the, the, I, I, I've uh, often had to go against the grain in the sheriff's department, as George knows. No one really understood where I was coming from, and I didn't care that they did for the moment. But I appreciated where I wanted to go. And all you need to do to find your love is not for someone else to understand you and the things that are troubling you, but for you to appreciate how good you can be. Can you teach people to love their life when they're in Yes. Oh, man, I, I tell you, I invite you all to go to our merit program where the inmates are there that have been two or three time big time losers, and we're teaching them about leadership. Why, why would you teach prisoners about leadership? It would be a better burglar, right? But, 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 but when you teach them about leadership, 
You know what? You know what happens? It's a miracle. They're like children. They say, oh, "Why didn't anyone ever tell us this before?" And I got deputy sheriff teaching this class. But when you teach, and I'm trying to teach you a little bit about leadership, you, you know. And you know, let, let's just say to you, you are a great leader because you have great feelings. But you don't need someone else to validate you. You you have it within your whole soul and your whole capacity as a person to find that wellness point inside of you that does not depend on anybody else's validation. That's where I am. I don't need anybody to tell me I'm good or this and that. All I need is to believe that I won't do things that are harmful to myself or to other people. It's leadership because you see, if you want to be, who wants to be a leader in the room? All right, we all want to raise our hands. Come on, you're good leaders anyway. If you're social workers, are social workers not leaders? Yes, we are. Oh well, yeah, you are. So who wants to be a social worker? <laughs> Come on, everybody's got to get their hands up. We're all social workers, whether you like it or not. If you're living a good life and you're positive, you're a social worker. Okay. So the thing about leaders. And what I'll say to you, I would ask you to be a social worker leader. The first point of leadership is to lead yourself. Treat yourself to your own leadership skills. And you know what? You will get to that inner core. And I'll tell you this about relationships. Whether it's mom, dad, didn't do it right, and boyfriend who promised and broke your heart. All those things that happen, and they're going to happen to you if they haven't happened already. But... All that doesn't diminish who you are. Only in the end, you are what you let in. You are what you let in. And you know what God gave me? The greatest tool on earth. When Grandma told me, you should leave. Uh, Leroy is my first name. Now talk about that. Leroy. Who ever heard of a Mexican named Leroy? But, but, so I put up a lot of criticism and a lot of ridicule as a young person. Okay, but I never let it in because it doesn't help me. So she said to me, Leroy, you keep that up, you're never going to amount to anything. And then you ever heard a parent tell you you're never going to amount to anything? Okay, well, you know, that can be painful, right? You know what my answer to my grandma was? Well, I love dearly, and she's, she's buried now. But the whole point is, I says, we'll wait and see who wins on that. I never will t you know, I've got a rule, and, and you know, I'm not going to get to the literal of the rule, but you know that word, it's a nasty word, it's spelled S-H-I-T, okay? I don't give shit, and I don't take shit. That's what it amounts to. I don't care if it's my mother, my father, my friends, my wife. Whatever it is, I, I do not put up with anything from anybody, including members of Congress when I testified in behalf of Muslims in America on an issue that was well reported and so forth. I don't take anything that's negative from anybody, but I don't give it. And not giving negative is where your grace is. You don't give negative. And there's your core of leadership. You must lead yourself. Don't wait for someone else to lead you at this stage in your life because you're too smart. Okay. <laughs> um, I think they're quick. Um, so my first question is, do you think that gang violence um, will always be an issue in Los Angeles? And then the second one, so I'm going to try again, um, where do you see the line is, um, when talking about gang members between people who are victims and people who are perpetrators? Well, that's a hard question to answer. It's a very hard question to answer. No, I, I think I don't think that it's, we're we're fated for gang problems all the rest of the history of mankind. I, I would I, I would not be qualified to do what I do if I believe that it's a hopeless problem and it's just the way it is. Uh, I'm trying to give you the remedy. I'm a fixer more than anything else. But uh, the and the remedy isn't just one way remedy. Uh, but I, I think that. In the, in, the, in the whole of your question, um, it's a tough life. 
You know, you know, I'm not naive about life. You know, I, I don't say, oh, you think everything is cool by eye. You just think all the flowers are wonderful and you love mountains and you like the oceans and you like people and blah, 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 blah. Let me tell you, when it comes right down to it, I'm a tough dude. You know why I'm a tough dude? Because I can take criticism. If you learn the skill of taking criticism as early in life as you can, you will overcome anything in this world. It, it, is, it is that powerful. So therefore, I'm inoculated. Now, gang members don't know how to handle criticism. They shoot guilt people over criticism. They're just so disjointed in their own core that they can't even figure it out for themselves. That's the problem. Now, the gentleman over here had a question. Yes, sir. The gentleman in the blue shirt. Yes, uh, as the state moves toward realignment, one of the considerations is that the sheriff's department will take over a uh, role for the youth coming out. I guess it used to be a youth authority. Right? Yeah. And is the thinking that the sheriff's department will take over the role? And if so, how do you sort of work to get positive uh, thoughts and feelings to new, uh, this new role for the sheriff's department? Uh, here's the deal on that. I'm the one who said I want the parole. Okay, and you know why I want the parole? Because I want the police to do the parole. Now, the police tell the police parolees, so what the police do is they, they have to uh, do what I'm saying, and that is help them find another way of thinking, which helps them find another way of living, which helps them fight for their own lives, as opposed to fighting the other gang on the other side of the street. And, and so the, the point about, I want transformation in policing as a safety tool, not just in a prevention tool, as not just an enforcement tool, that the whole darn thing starts with the police and not end with the police. And police that start to help young people, not so young people, uh, stay safe inside their hearts and minds, which means if they care enough about themselves, here's the real thing, guys. If you care so much about your life, you're incapable of harming somebody else's. You want to write that one down for a quiz? <laughs> if you care so much about your own life, you are incapable of doing anything to harm somebody else's. There is a physical, biological, scientific correlation between what I just said. And it structures itself in your anatomy. I believe that police are willing to go to extreme inconvenience just to catch criminals. I mean, we are the experts at managing our common fear that you and I share together to a certain extent. We all have fear. There's no such thing as a fearless cop. They all have the same fear that you have. The difference is, is they take it with them for a good purpose. Now, if we teach gangbangers to take their fear and use it for a good purpose, meaning nonviolence, we have a chance. The cops can teach parolees how to manage your so-called imbalances with women, and they have a lot of imbalances with women, and how to think straight and accept responsibility for your weakness. Would that require new efforts and training? Oh, the whole thing, the whole thing. But you, you see, I've been teaching deputies to be leaders for the last 12 years, and you know what? When, when I talk about anything about life, that we're going to talk about your own social work and things and so forth and so on, it's all about leadership. You don't know that, but you are leaders. You, you, you kind of really get into it. Leaders isn't about, you know, flying F-16s exclusively. It's not about, you know, cops and firefighters and all that stuff. It's about people who will take goodness and push it a little further in their daily reality and care about other people who are not so good. You know, and that, that's what I do. I care about people who are not so good. Now, what's the difference between me and Father Boyle? I've got the gun, he doesn't. Okay, but I've got power. And, and, and so the, the, he has persuasion, but, but I have persuasion as power. I, I, I leave the gun in the holster. I'm willing to say, you matter. And that's what I tell inmates in these programs. You matter. And you know what? We have a kumbaya. They're like you here. They're participating in everything. 
They're participating, and I'm listening. I listen not to just facts, I listen to the heart. You know when someone's hurt, just like this young lady. You know. But they want to have a hand. They, they, they want to have a helping hand. Right? I'm just, got it. I know. <laughs> That's all right. You're, you're great. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. I, I don't want, I, it, lunch time's over with, right? Yeah, we have about five more minutes. Okay, I don't want to understand. <laughs> Well, we talked a lot about that, the youth program, this and that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I know where you guys are. The cops are the bad guys, and the interventions are the good guys. Now, go ahead, sit, sit, sit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there's a VEDA program that I explained. That's intervention. We have uh, about 30 deputies teaching in elementary schools and junior high schools. That's intervention. We have 60 youth centers where we have after-school programs for the kids, and we take them uh, into learning domains with computers, and we give them art and PE, and all kinds of other activities It's after school. And then on Saturdays, we take them to camps, up in the mountains, and stuff like that. Well, intervention, if you want to tell me what intervention means to you, and I'll tell you how it's intervention. I mean, you're saying that, um Intervention to me is having an interpersonal relationship with someone that is mm -hmm. never a positive role model. Mm -hmm. But how is intervention facilitating people with, with um, like, for example, computers and stuff like that you mentioned? Well, because intervention is the art of helping someone think differently when you know they're not thinking in a way that's productive for themselves. So when they're busy learning new skills, they're able to see that they have talent. And the more you teach a person about their own talent, the better they feel about themselves. Miss Frank, exactly. Cool. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Sure. Well, all, right. all right, do I need a question? Yes. Um, I really like what you're saying about the positive stuff and the leadership and the finding skills, but what happens when our children find those leadership skills and positive influences? Well, I, I would ordinarily agree with your point, but I really don't. And, 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 and I'll tell you why, because all gang members, in spite of uh, what we think of them, know right from wrong. I, I believe that unless you're psychotic or, or has mental illness, all human beings know right from wrong. And they know that being a gang is not right even if it feels right. You see, you see, part of the issue of right and wrong is there is no ambiguity as to what is right and what is wrong. And gangs, ostensibly, uh, for the most part, uh, have not connected with the real purpose of living. Now, I've been trying to give you the psychology side of the purpose of living, but I'll give you the, the, the more stronger side. The whole purpose of living is to educate yourself. That's what it is. Now, I don't want to get into all the different opinions as to the purpose of life. Some will say, well, it's to procreate, and some will say it's to join a gang, or some will say it's other things. But, but the universal purpose of life is to learn, and gangs don't learn much. You, you know, you see, let, let, me, let me tell you this. Uh, the brain is the ultimate creation, right? We start with that. If you, if you believe something else is the ultimate creation, I'm okay with that. I don't want to have you agree with me. But I'm trying to get you the formula as to what constitutes a life worth living. What constitutes a life worth living is you want to know all there is about life. And gang members aren't interested in integrating. They're not interested in tolerating. What they do is they set themselves up as us versus them us against them. 
That's so positive existence. That's not love. You know, I, I listen to the wiretaps that we do with gang members on their cell phones. But let me give you a clue, a real clue about this that you just said. So we got this uh, Latino gang that wants to retaliate against the black gang in Compton. And on the wiretaps, these gang members are not bright. Okay, if you were bright, you'd stay away from the gang. But they, they got their reasons for that level of reinforcing in love. And so the shot caller is not going to get out and put the gun in his hand. We talked about that earlier, right? So what they did is they had this young guy who wasn't too bright. Well, he wanted to prove his worthiness of love within the gang. And so he takes this big gun. He goes to the opposite gang, which is a black gang. And he's looking for a black gang member to shoot and kill. Anyone. And he can't find one. And you know what the shot caller said to him? Shoot any black you see. And you know what he did? He shot the first black he saw. They had nothing to do with the gang. Nothing to do with anything. But you see, that's the malevolence of love in its worst form because of a gang causing this idea of loyalty above common sense and decency and that sort of thing. So therein is the point. The number one value that we all must persist in is what you're doing now. You're getting educated. Everything counts that's knowledgeable. And my only thing is that I'm trying to stretch it all out in 100 years. You know, I've been all over the world, the Middle East particularly, because the Muslims are now getting picked on. You know, and so I go over there and I meet with the Muslim police chiefs in Qatar and Jordan. I was in Egypt three months ago. I know the police chief of Egypt. You know, I'm trying to widen you out. You know, we're talking about gangs, but you know, this is more about you, you know, not me. This is about you understanding that you can do as much as you want and learn as much as you want, or you can stay in your own narrow little world and try to solve everybody else's problems. I, I say this, make your world as big as it is. And you know what I tell the inmates? They love this. This is the summary of my point. Create a palace in your mind or the world will be your prison. Thank you.